Hello, it's Thursday the 21st of December in the year of our Lord 2023. As listeners know, and I have mentioned it and I have been posting on social media, I've been doing a big deep dive into Puff Daddy and the whole hip hop industry. And boy, is it dirty. I mean, I, during the like late 80s and 90s, you know, I loved it. I, I, I like the Beastie Boys. I, I loved them. Run DMC. Loved them. Just, but that was just the music. I never knew what was behind it. So because I want to do like this expose, I want everyone to get a feel of what the hip hop industry is all about and how it all started. And one person I thought would be the best person to talk about it because he talks about it in three of his books is the one and only superstar DJ, Mr. Mark Devlin. Hi, Mark. Hey, Lou, what's going on? Happy winter solstice to you. Happy winter solstice. Are you all geared up? So the chaos of the, the whole three days that the country go crazy for? You all well, the rest of my family is. I tend to hover in the background. Uh, I did a video the other day just saying how connected I now feel to equinoxes, solstices and the seasons, you know, the time of the year. I'm less connected to the material nonsense that yeah, gets added it to it. Material. it is. I've, I've, I think I've bought one present. I haven't done anything. I have never felt uh, so unfestive. It's like it just, 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 just whatever. Anyway, yeah, we're playing the Grinches in yes, this whole we thing. Are. Just getting on. We're, we're just to that generation, Mark. Um, yeah. So let's talk. So you obviously know an awful lot about the music industry. You've written some ama- three amazing books. I want to talk specifically about P Diddy, and I want to paint the story. So I'm just telling, you, I want to paint the story about the hip hop industry. So you're the best person to talk about. I want to know how the whole hip hop industry started, the 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 east side, west side, the two packs, the, all of these people going back to sort of the 80s um, and where it all stemmed from. And you're the man. So Mark Devlin, over to you. Okay, well, I shouldn't tie you up for more than about 12 hours if you give me your undivided <laughs> you attention. It a little bit. Yeah, this will be a 92 part series. Uh, All right, where to begin? Well, hip-hop culture is acknowledged as having begun in 1973. So we're on the 50th anniversary year, and there have been various celebrations this year, sort of taking it back to those early days of the Bronx in New York. That's the spiritual home of hip-hop culture. I actually did an amazing show with a guy called Black Dot a few years ago, and he was looking at the five pillars of hip-hop culture, which are the music, uh, the rapping, the turntablism, the uh, graffiti art, and the break dancing. And then the fifth element is the spiritual side of things, knowledge of self. So this guy is, you know, he's deep and he's into spiritual concepts. And he was pointing out how this represents the five elements of earth, air, fire, water, spirit. They represent in in these tenets of hip hop. And also how hip hop culture effectively represents African tribal traditions, reborn for a modern era. So he was saying the rapping is a modern interpretation of the griot, which was a storyteller in African tribal traditions uh, who would relate great wisdom through words. Then you've got the drummer in these sort of ceremonies who would be tapping out these rhythms and the turntablism with the scratching going back and forth is a rhythmic interpretation of that element. Then the hieroglyphs, are represented in graffiti art. So, you know, graffiti, when done properly, is a a modern rendering of hieroglyphic symbols. Uh, And then you've got the uh, dancing. So it would have been ceremonial dancing, sort of in a, a, uh, you know, uh, tribal setting. And that's represented through the breakdancing element of hip hop. And then you've got the spiritual side of things, which is knowledge of self. So it seems that the culture started out with noble intent, but it was very quickly steered off in certain desired directions. And I've heard that the CIA has had a major hand in the themes that have gone into rap and hip-hop music uh, over the years. That doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, So, you know, it got its roots in the 70s. In the 80s, you had groups like Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, and they were putting out records like The Message and White Lines, and it was social commentary. It seemed to be... Uh, meaningful content and there were many other records of that nature and the golden 
period of hip hop, the golden years, is considered to be sort of the late 80s through to the mid 90s. I'd probably put it at about 88 through to 95. But then from 97, things really started going down the toilet. And yeah. a lot of hip hop critics and fans like myself and DJs lay the blame for the demise of hip hop and the degradation of the lyrical themes uh, at the door of one Sean Combs, a.k.a. Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, Diddy, or whatever the hell he's calling himself this week, Diddley. Uh, so he had his record label Bad Boy Records, which came out of Arista. He was hired initially by Clive Davis, who was the head honcho over at Arista. And he was affiliated with a guy named Andre Harrell, who helped him launch Bad Boy Records as a sort of imprint sub-label of Arista. And so Diddy was charged with signing up a whole load of rappers to this label, the most famous of whom would have been Notorious B.I.G., Biggie Smalls. Uh, he was assassinated, murdered in March of 97, a lot of people feel that Diddy would have been involved in that in some way. I mean, we can get into that later if you like. Uh, and then there were rappers like Craig Mack, uh, Shine. <laughs> These have all got stories in themselves. Uh, G-Dep, Loon, uh, some R&B groups like 112, Total, uh, more recently Danny Kane, Cassie. We should certainly talk about Cassie. These were all signed to Bad Boy Records. A guy named Mark Curry, not to be confused with the BBC presenter in the eighties of the same His name. His book arrived today, actually. Oh right, cool. You it's got the book. This yeah? morning. <laughs> yeah. So Mark Curry's had a lot to say about P Diddy. So it seems that round about ninety seven, these lyrical themes that started to creep into hip hop lyrics were deliberate and were designed to uh, degrade and debase the culture and everything that it represented. So a few years prior to the arrival of Puffy and Bad Boy and his sort of glory years, you had the arrival of gangster rap. So there were groups like NWA that were putting out uh, these controversial albums. And uh, the whole genre of gangster rap would appear to have been contrived. It was deliberate, purposeful. There's this famous meeting, which is said to have taken place at the home of a record company executive. And for years, I didn't know who that executive was, but somebody told me who it was just the other day. And it doesn't surprise me at all, where the heads of the major record labels of the time that were all putting out hip hop output were instructed to attend this meeting and they wheeled in a couple of representatives from the private prison industry in the United States for profit prisons. And they spoke to these record company executives about how they wanted them to get their artists to start rapping about criminal lifestyles. So, you know, drugs, guns, pimps, hoes, drive by shootings, this sort of thing. And their idea was that very impressionable dumb young males that were into this music, according to them, uh, would start to emulate the criminal lifestyles of their hip hop heroes and thus start filling up the private prisons all over the United States. And given that this industry is for profit, these executives said we all stand to make an absolute killing, no pun intended, uh, through the money that will be generated from filling up these prisons with these young males that have been coerced into criminal lifestyles through hip-hop music. So wow. that was the early 90s. That That's said to have taken place in 91. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I had then, no but, idea about this side. I had absolutely no idea because right. that's the total sense of where we are today. Right. Well, there was a letter which was leaked to the hip-hop press many years ago now and it was from one of these executives, purportedly, one of these guys from the record labels that was instructed to attend the meeting. And he said that he sat on this for years and years and didn't want to rock the boat because of any consequences that might come his way. But in the end, his conscience got the better of him. And he thought, I can't stay silent about this any longer. I've got to reveal what I know. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, it's a fake. It's a hoax. But I don't think it was. It rings absolutely true. It resonates with the way I know hip hop music did go. Uh, I actually witnessed a lot of young males starting to adopt criminal lifestyles because of what they were hearing in the music. So it's not too much of a stretch to assume that this letter was genuine. And so uh, then we get to 97 uh, and the 
murder of Notorious B.I.G., which occurred six months after the murder of Tupac. That was September 96. And according to many commentators, that was sort of nailing the, the final nails in the coffin of the meaningful years of hip hop. So from the mid 90s onwards, you had the glorification of material lifestyles. So it was champagne, crystal, uh, expensive fur coats, expensive uh, fashions, gold chains, jewellery, uh, th throwing up wads of money in the club, uh, flossing, balling, you know, drinking champagne up in the VIP, this sort of thing. And so much of that came from Bad Boy Records under the directorship of P. Diddy. And that's the way hip hop culture then went for many, many years. Uh, so all the spirituality had been destroyed, all the meaningful elements of it had been destroyed. It was all about just spending loads of money, uh, the glorification of various fashion brands and meaningless, vacuous, empty lifestyles. So uh, Sean Combs is guilty of so much of that. Yeah, yeah. And where does he link in? Because I want to talk about Jay-Z, obviously. Um, is it Jaguar? Jaguar Wright, is that her name? Jaguar Wright, yep. Yep, there's her. She's coming out with so much. She's talking about Aaliyah. She's talking about Mary. I mean, Mary J. Blige. That was it on 911? On the 411? What's the 411? Yeah. Oh, I tell you what, that album is that's like my anthem from my party days. I mean, what an album. That's that material. Oh, God, I've got goose pimples just thinking about it. Um, so I want to bring those in. So, Diddy, Biggie. What happened? Because is this all pre-Jay-Z? I mean, how does Jay-Z, because this man is the epitome of... If we look at P. Diddy's history, I can't take that name seriously. <laughs> I always knew him as Puff Daddy. He was always known as Puffy back in the day. He's had so many bloody aliases. Yeah, he was always uh, Puffy. Always Puffy. Puffy, exactly. Um, so he was born Sean Combs, and his father was a small-time hustler and gangster, Melvin Combs. So I mentioned this in my Musical Truth One book. He was an affiliate of Frank Lucas, who is the gangster character that Denzel Washington portrays in the movie American Gangster. And Melvin Combs was found shot dead in a car on the edge of Central Park in New York when Puffy was a young boy. In interviews, Puffy early on said that he wanted to emulate his father's lifestyle and spirit so in other words he aspired to be a gangster just like his old man uh, so that i'm sure has had some bearing on the approach that he's had towards his business ventures so bad boy records as well as glorifying champagne and all these material lifestyles and stuff also pushed criminal lifestyles so it did have a lot of rappers talking about drive-by shootings and murders and drug deals and all this and Notorious B.I.G. certainly talked about a lot of that in his stuff. So he was alternatively known as Biggie Smalls. And that name came from a gangster movie, sort of black exploitation flick in the mid 70s, where there was a character named Biggie Smalls. So Christopher Wallace, Notorious B.I.G., took the name Biggie Smalls from that movie. And he had a very short career, actually. People forget he put out his album Ready to Die, which was an instant classic in 1994. Actually, all the titles of Biggie's albums seem to be very prescient and portentous, given what happened to him. So he had Ready to Die, <clears throat> which he put out, you know, to announce his arrival on the scene. And then his second album was Life After Death. And it was released just a few days before he was murdered in March of 97 in Los Angeles. And then, of course, the album went absolutely stratospheric as a tribute to his life. I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of artists seem to release albums or some kind of material just before they yeah, check out. Yeah, really conveniently. It Very, really is. Yeah. yeah. It, it happens with movies as well, yeah, with exactly. famous actors. So, yeah, Life After Death. And then... Uh, a posthumous album of unreleased material was titled Born Again. So very interesting names to conjure with. So a lot of people feel that Puffy was somehow implicated in Biggie's murder. Very conveniently, he was not traveling in the same car as Big when he got shot up in this drive-by shooting. 
So Puffy travelled in a separate vehicle. Phew. Lucky. Um, even though they used to knock around together and, you know, go everywhere together. He even talks about it in his song, I'll Be Missing You, that cover of the police song, Every Breath You Take, you know. He's talking about uh, hanging out with Big and catching yeah. flicks together and all of this. But for some reason, they weren't together on that fateful night. And as I say, this was six months after the murder of Tupac. And this sparked the so-called East Coast, West Coast beef within hip hop, which was quite obviously a dialectic. The same forces were controlling both sides, which we've seen so many times. So you had primarily Death Row Records over in Los Angeles, headed up by Marion Suge Knight, also a gangster. Uh, I believe he's currently in prison. He's been in and out of prison on various charges, murder linked charges. linked to Whitney Houston's daughter. So am I dreaming that? Sorry, what? He wasn't linked to Whitney Houston's daughter, was he? I don't believe so. No, no that was okay, a separate somebody affair. Else. Right, okay. Though uh, an individual that links Whitney Houston with Puffy is Clive Davis, the aforementioned, because yes. Clive Davis was Whitney Houston's mentor, and he's said to have discovered her and put her on the map. And Whitney Houston whispered something into his ear the night before she was found dead in a bathtub in the LA Beverly Hilton uh, with a daughter Bobby Christina by her side and Bobby Christina a few years on was also found dead yeah, in yeah. a bathtub but yeah we'll get on to Clive know. Davis a bit later because he's a nasty one yeah so get back to Puffy and two back and co yeah exactly you see how many tangents there are here I it's know so I to, know it's so easy to wander off I could so, honestly keep you on this probably till this time tomorrow because know, there's right. so many rabbit holes to go down I haven't I haven't come out for air yet in the last week <laughs> right I'm start, try, trying to stay on track here. So within the music industry, we've got the idea of ritual sacrifices. So those that want to become rich and famous and successful, we are told, are able to achieve that by offering up a family member or a close personal friend as a ritual sacrifice. And that facilitates their rise up the ladder to prominence and wealth. Puffy, for many years has been at the top of the Forbes rich list in hip-hop, one of the richest men in the game. He's usually up there with Dr. Dre and Jay-Z. So those three names sort of change places, but they're always in the top three of that list. So Puffy has achieved that, and we can speculate as to what price he would have had to have paid. And some commentators feel that Big E, who was a, a friend, we're told, as well as his main artist on Bad Boy Records, was offered up as that ritual sacrifice. So that event occurred 9th of March, 97. And certainly Puffy's career did go absolutely through the roof from that. And he became a millionaire, if not billionaire. But at what price, we can ask. Also, straight after Biggie was murdered, Jay-Z's career went absolutely stratospheric as well. So Jay-Z had come on the scene in 96 with his debut album, Reasonable Doubt, which is considered a hip-hop classic, along with Big Is Ready to Die and Nas's Illmatic. Those are the sort of three staple classic albums from the golden years of hip-hop in the 90s. So Jay-Z had been a struggling rapper for many years under the mentorship of this guy named Jazz O, but he wasn't really getting anywhere. Then he gets signed to, uh, well, Rockefeller Records, get it rock uh fella uh so what's in a name yeah that was the record label set up by damon dash uh kareem what's the other guy's name there was a third guy uh, kareem something or other and jay-z so reasonable doubt comes out in 96 jay-z starts to make an Im impact on the scene then <clears throat> He records a record with Biggie called Brooklyn's Finest. That's a duet which appeared on Life After Death. Then Biggie gets murdered. And then Jay-Z <clears throat> instantly takes the number one position in hip hop. So Biggie had been the sort of main rapper, the, the, the biggest news coming out of New York up to that point. Uh, Biggie's removed from the scene. Jay-Z becomes number one rapper, I would argue, for many, many years from that point forward. At the same time, we've got the rise of Beyonce with the group Destiny's Child, and then she breaks free of that group, becomes a solo artist, and hooks up with Jay-Z. And we're told that they're in a romantic relationship, they get married, and so you have the, the number one rapper married to the number one R&B singer, and they're an item for many, many years going forward. So that's one strand of the story. Uh, if we want to try and stay on track with Diddy, 
then what happens with him is he starts signing up a whole bunch of different artists to his label. The book that you just mentioned by Mark Curry called Dance. Dancing with the Devil, How Puff Burnt the Bad Boys of Hip Hop, details how every artist that was ever signed to Bad Boy Records had some sort of unfortunate fate yeah. occur to him. So the most extreme was Biggie, who was murdered, shot up. But then you've got Shine, the rapper known as Shine. And he was fitted up for an incident which occurred at the end of 1999 when Puffy went to a nightclub with J-Lo, Jennifer Lopez. So we're told that was his girlfriend at the time. Yeah. I'm not buying it. As far as I'm concerned, J-Lo was what's known as a beard. So... When you have individuals who are homosexual, they're often seen out with women because their controllers want to sell the image of them as heterosexual. So Tony Blair, for example, <laughs> is anyone well, buying? I've had a nice morning to bring that in. <laughs> uh, I know some of these names make me feel oh. physically sick. But Tony Blair, is anyone buying that Sherry is, is really his wife? And he's in a romantic relationship and, you know. Uh, they are a very he's a, odd couple. He's a straight male. I'm not buying it. Sherry is a beard. Sherry is. She's, I don't know what Sherry is, but yeah. Sherry probably has a beard. <laughs> uh, so then, you know, you got Puffy in the late 90s knocking around with J-Lo and we're told they're an item. But I personally think that Puffy is a homosexual. There's lots of evidence to support this. Professor Griff, out of Public Enemy, came out many years ago and said that Puffy is a gay man. He's always been shouting he, about it, hasn't he, Professor Griff? He's been, like for years and years he's yeah. been he's been shouting about it years. He has, yeah. And I've tried to do shows with Professor Griff many times and we got very close and it just never happened, which is a great shame because he's got a lot of knowledge. But Griff was talking years ago about this ritual that Puffy had to undergo in order to get his fame and success. And it comes out of Skull and Bones, which is the Secret Society Mystery School fraternity in Yale University. And this is a ritual which reportedly bonesmen, so-called, have to undergo. And Griff claims that Puffy underwent this ritual. And it involves lying naked in a coffin while you pleasure yourself and recount your sexual history. And you have your peers standing around the coffin looking on. It's not really my idea of a party, but maybe really... I'm just old fashioned. Yeah. So he so, went. He, he he got. He went down to Yale. Right. Okay. Well, I'm not sure if the ritual took yeah, place but... at Yale, but it's a ritual that comes out of Skull and Bones at Yale, according to Griff. Okay. And then th there's pictures of Puffy with other men cavorting with men, and he looks very happy. And um, maybe we've got a few clues on some of the records because Puffy always used to appear on his artist records. And according to Mark Curry, it really pissed a lot of the other rappers off because Puffy would insist on appearing in the video, dancing around in a shiny suit. And nobody wanted him on their record, but he was just there. And he's yeah. in the background of many bad boy records. And he's going, you know, take that, take that, take that. And, and things like that so maybe we're getting a bit of a clue as to his true nature there you know he's always on there going uh-huh yeah that's right am i, am that, I right that. in believe that he would really um court somebody uh say you'll sign him up say they'll sign them up you know he, he he sees a young kid say a 15 year old doing some street rap battle and he goes he said he's going to give him a six album deal um they'll they'll get you know when they're such a young age you'll go yeah we'll give you 250 grand you know you've got six album deal you know they think that's that's absolutely amazing they'll go and literally sell their souls to him they're out partying non-stop this young guy is still waiting for his albums you know can we get in the recording studio but they're too busy partying they're doing this you know nothing's happening after a year, there's still nothing happening. So, like, I've had enough of this. I want to go. He signed up. They, these kids can't get out of the deals. They can't. They can't do anything. Um, Diddy won't get them in the recording studios to record. And now, by this time, they're so hooked on on drugs and everything else. But then they just signed off. And then, if anyone does recognise their music, years down the line, Diddy gets all. Diddy gets all the royalties. I mean, it's such a con. Yeah. 
this is what Mark Curry talks about in that book okay. about okay. how every artist that ever hooked up with Puff has ended up being financially screwed and they just emerge from it in poverty. Uh, a lot of them turn to religion. What does that say about their experience? You know, Mace, who Puffy put on the map, uh, did a few records with him, and then Mace left Bad Boy Records, became a Christian minister. Shine went to jail for this incident in the nightclub. So what happened was Puffy w- went into this nightclub with J-Lo, um, and reportedly he had a wad of cash, and uh, no, 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 it was, a, sorry, it was a, a rival of his, some sort of gang uh, member, who came up to Puffy and taunted him by waving this wad of cash in his face, and then he threw the cash up in the air, And it's all raining down, which is where we get this phrase, making it rain within hip hop. Uh, It's supposed to be rappers that are so rich they can afford to just throw wads of cash in the air and let the notes rain down. And there was this skirmish in the nightclub where people were scrabbling to get one of these notes. And during that skirmish, uh, a gun went off and somebody was shot. And the claim is that it was Puffy who pulled the, the trigger. But um, there was a a chase which ensued, a car chase. So the police are chasing the car that Puffy's in and Shine's in the car as well, this other rapper. And a gun was thrown out of the window. And what happened was Shine ended up taking the rap for it and he went to jail. But according to many, he was innocent and Puff paid him a huge sum of money to take the rap and do the jail time. And then when Shine emerged from jail, he converted to Judaism, changed his name and become a minister within that religion. So it's never a happy ending for any of these rappers that hook up with Puff. What about, um, was that um, DMX and there was DMX or somebody else who went down and they brought Diddy into it? Because DMX went down and that was, that, was, that was Diddy related as well, I do believe. I'm not sure if there was a link between DMX and Diddy. I mean, DMX died uh, a few years ago, aged 50, oh, wow. reportedly after taking an arm spear. Uh because he oh, wanted really? to go on tour. Really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then shortly afterwards, he turns up dead. Go figure. Yeah, I know. I know. So um, what about the whole Aaliyah? Because, I mean, she was, she was, she was something else. She really, really was. She was going places, that woman. And we know about the R. Kelly, who married her when she was under 18. I think he took over guardianship of her some, somehow. Then the parents found out the marriage was annulled. She ended up with Damien Dash. But there are reports that Jay-Z wanted a piece and I think Diddy wanted a piece. And all this. What, how does, um, how do these women, um, I mean, do these some are still alive, these incredible women, get involved with, you know, Mary J. Blige, as we were saying, Lil' Kim, I think Lil' Kim was involved there. What, what What's going on with all the, these women in the hip-hop around that time of the Diddy come up? Yeah, it's like a family tree that you can draw up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Branches and, it, you know, everything's connected ultimately. So Aaliyah got put on the scene in 1994 with her album Age Ain't Nothing But A Number. Again, what's in a name? What's in a title? Um, And she was aged 15. And there were reports that she'd been in a sexual relationship with R. Kelly. And they ended up getting married, as you say, in Las Vegas. And then it was discovered that Aaliyah was only 15. And so the marriage was annulled. But R. Kelly is credited with having put her on the map. So he was also very influential, had a lot of clout in the sort of R&B and hip hop scene in the 90s. And we've learned in recent years about some of his extracurricular activities and stuff that he's into, unsavory sexual practices. All through the 90s and into the 2000s, there were rumours about R. Kelly. Any DJs or anyone that was close to the sort of R&B, hip hop, urban scene all knew about these claims that R. Kelly uh, made videos of himself with young girls getting up to all kinds of unpleasant things. And there were supposed to be these secret tapes of R. Kelly that were floating around. And I wondered for years how he was getting away with this. If these rumours were true and if these tapes existed, how was he getting away with this? This is before I woke up to the true nature of the music business, of course, and really comprehended how it all worked. But eventually, as we know, they threw R. Kelly under the bus. And all these revelations about him basically running this sort of harem 
this cult, sort of sex cult, where he had loads of young women uh, living in this communal situation and they were getting sexually abused and mind controlled and all of this, all of this stuff came out. So Aaliyah would appear to have been an early victim of all of that stuff. So her career was very short. I loved her music. She put out some great. Fantastic. Yeah. Great music. Uh, oh, I, I did. I, I loved it. I mean, I, and there used to be SWV. Mary J. Blige was the main thing. Exactly. Uh, yeah. On the four, the, on the four one one. Oh, that, oh, wow. I know. I know. Okay. So Diddy's, Diddy's climbing. He's climbing and he's climbing. And he's mixing with people like Jay-Z. He's mixing with billionaires who are, are kind of helping him up. He's getting involved with all sorts. Um, then we have to because Jay Z was Jay Z really came about with the Beyonce era, didn't he? That's when that's when he, people started in everyday like everyday world, not in the rap world. That's when really people started to know about Jay Z. I think was it not? Yeah, into the two thousands, I'd say, yeah, yeah, when yeah. he became a household name. Yeah. And the funny thing is, Jay Z never really had any massive hits, not really massive ones. I mean, Beyonce had Crazy in Love, and everyone knows that. But if you stop the average person in the street and said, "Have you heard of Jay Z?" they'd say, "Of course I have." And then if you said, "Can you name three Jay Z records?" I think most people would struggle. But Jay Z and Beyonce were just put out as a celebrity couple, and mainstream society was instructed to like them and follow them because that's the way it works. You know, it's the same with Kanye West and Kim Kardashian. They just put these two together and stick them out there and uh, they become famous and talked about and they're in all the gossip columns and stuff. Just to finish off on the Aaliyah story, though, yeah. uh, another unhappy ending, sadly. So she died in a plane crash in the Bahamas on the 25th of August, 2001. So it was 17 days before the events of 9-11. I know this because in my new novel, The Gift and the Curse, the opening chapter takes place on the 25th of August, 2001, when the news of Aaliyah's passing has just come in. So she was filming a video in the Bahamas with a film crew. Hype Williams, this very famous uh, video director, was there also, but he wasn't on the plane. So lucky old Hype, you know. He's the plane... there as well, wasn't he? I heard it was Jay Z that threw her into the back of the, uh, threw her into the back of the um, that, the plane. I've not heard that Jay Z was there. That's that's not something that's ever come across my radar. But oh, it's probably I, just uh, clickbait. Well, yeah, possibly. Hype Williams didn't travel on the plane, so lucky for him. But Aaliyah and a few others died, and this was right after Aaliyah had uh, released this movie, Romeo Must Die. So she was in that and she'd just had an album put out recently with most of it produced by Timberland as well. So there's another example of an artist dying uh, just after they've put some product into the world. Aaliyah was in a relationship for a time with Damon Dash. So Damon Dash was the co-curator of Rock Fella Records alongside Jay-Z. Aaliyah's best friend was reportedly Kidada Jones, the daughter of Quincy Jones, and Kadada Jones was previously in a relationship with Tupac. So you see how incestuous this whole thing is. Uh, it really is. There's connections and links at every turn. So some feel that Aaliyah's death, bizarre as it was, untimely as it was, may have served as some sort of sacrifice on Dame Dash's part. Obviously, you, you can never prove these things, but uh, that's what some have speculated on. So... All these stories do seem to be interconnected ultimately. So you got R. Kelly involved in the Aaliyah story. Most recently, uh, R. Kelly's been thrown under a bus and uh, his past has caught up with him. And it seems that the same process is starting to happen to Diddy. So I'm just wondering if these individuals, after years and years of faithful service to the industry, and who knows what else they've had to do to achieve their fame and success, somehow outlive their usefulness and pass their sell-by date and they become expendable because they seem to be protected for a long time. I mean, we can get into Africa Bambata and Tim Westwood if you want because... Yeah, definitely. I mean, I do want to talk about Tim Westwood because he really was the voice of hip-hop in the UK. Totally, totally. You know, I can remember tuning into Tim Westwood, you know, when I was... 
in a bit, you know, in senior school, listening to Tim Whitworth, I think I was really cool. I mean, I had a Beastie Boys jacket and I had a VW, which I got on Carnaby Street. And then some woman on the bus screamed at me because she'd had hers nicked off of a Volkswagen. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mind the Carnaby Street. But um, yeah, let's, let's, let's talk about them, please. Yeah, I've got stories for days about Tim Westwood. I because part two, Mark, if, if I know how busy you are, but we may need to do a part two. We may need to, yeah. Yeah, we'll see. But um, when I was coming up in the game as a DJ in the 90s, I looked up to Tim Westwood. He was a personal hero of mine. We've all got him. You know, we've all had him. So he was on Capital Radio at the time doing the Capital Rap Show. And it was the show to listen to. If you were into rap and hip hop, Westwood Capital Rap Show, that was where you went to get all the latest releases and and you know, just to keep up on who the hottest rappers were coming through. Um, and then Westwood went to Radio 1, of course, in 1994, and he had the Radio 1 rap show. He was on Radio 1 for almost 20 years. It was 19 and a bit years. He didn't quite make the 20 years. And I think that's because there were stories already circulating by then, 2013, about stuff that he got up to. <laughs> Well, yeah, uh, another BBC, Yeah, you know, Whatever. Yeah. And the last thing the BBC needed in the wake of the Savile scandal in 2013 was news of another of their presenters involved in unsavoury sexual activity. So I heard that they got rid of Westwood very, very quickly. And then he got picked up by Capital Extra. And he did his show on that station for many years, all the way through to when would it have been? 2022. I think it was April of 22 when revelations about Westwood or accusations about Westwood emerged, several women, all black, say that Westwood sexually abused them when they were uh, very young, in some cases as young as 14. These claims go all the way back to 1982. That's the earliest one. The interesting thing is that in 1982, Westwood wasn't even famous yet because he didn't break through until the late 80s. So nobody knew who he was in 1982, but we're told that he was still up to this stuff even back then. And multiple women have now come forward. There were two BBC documentaries in which they aired their claims. And apparently there are investigations underway by both the BBC. So that will go well then. And yeah. the Metropolitan Police. But every now and again, I check back and I type into Google latest news, Tim Westwood. And all that I hear is that these, these investigations are ongoing. I mean, yep. yeah. They never go anywhere. So I think it's fairly safe to assume that Westwood has protection from on high. I'm not talking about the most high. I'm talking about protection exactly from yeah, yeah. Yeah, the upper echelons of the control system. I doubt that anything's going to happen to him. He's not going to do any jail time. Same way Russell Brand's not going to do any jail time. Uh, the story will fizzle out. It will get forgotten. Uh, the only reason Westwood became as prominent and successful as he did is because he had his career gifted to him, created for him. So his background is that he's the son of an Anglican bishop, the Reverend Bill Westwood. Uh, he used to be the Bishop of Peterborough and he held various other positions within the church. Uh, Tim went to Norwich Public School. So it's a very uh, posh, very posh public school. You know, he was a public school boy, he came from a very well to do family. Oh, goodness. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, his name's Timothy William Westwood, and that's the kind of upbringing he had. So then he came out of Norwich Public School in the 1970s, I guess. And then there's a long gap in his CV. So he eventually crops up on LWR Radio, which is a pirate radio station in London, and he starts doing a show for that station in about 1983. But from the late seventies through to eighty three, there's a big gap and you know, nobody really knows what he was doing. He wasn't DJing or he wasn't known on the scene by that point his career seems to have got going in 83 and then within a few years he'd been through the capital radio situation got onto radio one and he'd become arguably the most powerful man in hip-hop in britain so many critics of him feel that he was an appointed gatekeeper 
So he was inserted into the scene to make sure it got steered off in certain desired directions, to be very influential in terms of what artists got promoted and, more importantly, what lyrical themes got promoted through his Radio 1 show, which was listened listened to by millions and millions of people, huge audiences. And a lot of them would never previously have paid attention to rap and hip-hop, but then suddenly it's on Radio 1 on Friday and Saturday nights and it gained a whole new audience. People feel that David Rodigan was also an appointed gatekeeper. So in Rodigan's case, he was put into the reggae scene in the UK, and he became the most powerful and influential DJ within reggae. So Westwood and Rodigan share lots of common factors. So they both came from rather posh, well-to-do, upper-middle-class families, Rodigan was public school educated as well. His father was in the military. Rodigan grew up on various military bases in Germany. Uh, and then he becomes this big DJ within the reggae scene. And a lot of critics of Rodigan don't like the fact that you've got this upper class white public school boy, you know, at the top of their scene in the same way that a lot of hip hop fans are pissed off that you had this white public school boy, uh, at the top of the hip hop scene for many years. So that's the story with Westwood. He's currently embroiled in this controversy where these many, many women are accusing him of having sexually abused him. Uh, and then there's Bambata as well. So I'll take a pause for breath here, but we can talk about him as well if you want, because uh, it is all connected. It's, that's it. That this is this is the whole point. I want to just all of it. You know, the, the paedophile rings, the hip hop industry. Hollywood, all connected. Every single thing. You can go back to the Mark to True case. As I, I, I say this all the time, but you can go back to Mark to True case, uh, which is the shocking case over in Belgium uh, during the 80s where young girls were found hidden in a cellar. All these missing children had gone and they tried to say it was just one person doing it, but that's absolutely impossible because kids have been left in a in these cells for like six months while he was in prison none of it made sense they finally caught him he exposed everything but then they went with the narrative it was him on his own but regardless all of these mark de true is linked to balenciaga you can make those links you can make the links to jeffrey epstein you can make the links to jimmy savile the same it's it's everywhere and it's all the same people now i've been digging mark um, since on this Diddy, and I, I mean, this, I'm going to go into it because this is more of a history of stuff to come, but uh, of, of what's happening. And I'm, I'm coming right up to the future and the current players and the billionaires that are behind so much of this. So you were saying about, um, you said about people being financed and Diddy hanging around with all of these people. Well, they're still they're still running the show, Mark. They're still running the show. Yeah. Completely yeah. headed. And I think there's gonna be there's got to be major arrests after all of this. Well, there's lots of elephants in the room here, Lou. I mean, you know, the Tim Westwood situation, everyone should be talking about that. It's a big story, but most people just don't seem to care. And not only that, but I'm just alarmed at the fact that Westwood is still doing club kicks. So yeah. These stories broke in April of 22. He's apparently under investigation by the police. I'm not sure how the BBC putting out two documentaries in which these women voice their accusations is going to affect the case, because I would have thought that would have compromised it. And well, I thought, obviously, like what they did with Cliff Richards. Do yeah. you know I mean? it's, it's, it's the same MO, isn't it? Well, you'd think that the Metropolitan Police would say, well, you know, this investigation has been compromised now because the BBC have put out two documentaries. So there's no way he would get a fair trial and all this. But we're told that the investigation is ongoing. And then another huge elephant in the room is Africa Bambata. Yes. So taking it all the way back to the early days of hip hop culture in the 1970s. Uh, sorry. Uh, there are three founding fathers of hip hop culture. So, you know, when you when you come up in the sort of rap and hip hop scene, you are entrained to acknowledge these three individuals as having started the whole culture. So you've got Grandmaster Flash, 
who is credited with having invented the art of turntablism, which is the manipulation of records on uh, decks and scratching them back and forth and these various other techniques. Then you've got Cool Herc, who is a guy originally from a Jamaican family who set up sound systems in the Bronx in New York in the 1970s and through these block parties. And he's acknowledged as the father of you know, uh, hip hop parties, basically, uh, these hip hop events and sound systems and such. And then you've got Africa Bambata, who's credited with being the father of hip hop culture. So he added these elements of like the break dancing and the graffiti and uh, the, the sort of spiritual aspects of hip hop and brought those to the party. And so Bambata is a very important figure within hip hop culture. So way back in 2016, there was a story which broke involving this guy who'd been a part of the Universal Zulu Nation, which is this organization that Bambata founded. It morphed out of some street gangs in the Bronx area of New York. Uh, it was the Bronx River organization, and then they called themselves the Black Spades. And then out of that, you got the Universal Zulu Nation, which would take these young lads, these young boys from the ghettos, from the street, and recruit them into the ranks of the Zulu nation. And it was pushing Afrocentrism, sort of African spiritual studies and stuff. And on the surface, it all seems really good and wholesome and positive. But in 2016, a former member of the Universal Zulu nation, a guy by the name of Ronald Savage, accused Bambata of having sexually molested him when he was a teenager, underage. And then a second guy, Hassan Campbell, known as Poppy, came forth with similar claims, both claiming that Bambata had abused him. Then you had various other members of the Zulu Nation who came out and said, yeah, actually, it's been a best kept secret within this organization for many years. Uh, everyone knows that Bambata gets up to this sort of thing. He likes young boys. One member of the Universal Zulu Nation did an interview with an investigative journalist out of Chicago named Layla Wills. She was putting together a documentary called Trapped in a Culture, focusing on the Bambata story. TC Islam, shortly after doing that interview, turned up dead on the streets of Atlanta, if I recall. He was shot dead in the street in broad daylight. Nobody was caught for it. Echoes of Tupac and Biggie. So Bambata, if these allegations are true, has been getting away with it for getting on for eight years and nobody seems to care. Nobody seems to talk about it. He's still revered as this great figure within hip hop. Uh, you know, Hot 97 every Christmas, they put on Funkmaster Flex, call DJ Red Alert and Chuck Chill Out. And they do this seven hour marathon sort of hip hop show where they play old tunes and reminisce about the old stories. And they still talk about Bambata and he's still hailed as this hero of the culture of the scene and nothing happens to him. And I just wonder why. It's clear that he's protected, but people just don't seem to care. Why does nobody care? Why does I, nobody care this is about my this? answer. This is my big question mark, because... Um, my son loves you know, like XXX and Chashiel and Juice World, and I'm like, oh, you saying? And then he comes down and goes, no, no, they're they're saying that they did sell their souls, and they really regret it, yeah, but now they're dead. <laughs> but what they had to go through, and all of these young young kids are looking up to these guys who rap about rape, violence, Satan, you know, yeah. it's so openly. And these people, and that you know, they look up to P Diddy. Look at these freak outs. I mean, I'm we. I'm, I'm only going to try and do an hour. So we've got only we've got about ten minutes. But what yeah. uh, you know, we got to. I mean, there's so much. So I really would like to do a part two. You know, then we've got this young. I think we're going to have to. Yeah. You got um, you've got this Jaguar right coming out and saying all of this and the, about Beyonce and that the the fight in the elevator with with Assange, um, whatever her name is, Solange. Yeah, her. So it's so dark. People are saying, oh, why do you care about the celebrities? Well, because I've got a son that, okay, he's 18 now and I've got no right. But, I mean, he I have shown him. I've been showing him everything. So he is waking up. But there are all these young kids. And you hit the nail on the head there. And I didn't even think that about promoting this gangster life in prison. Because, yeah, the old rap times weren't like that. They weren't like that at all, were they? It was, you know, it was what's on the streets and they're doing all their dancing. And then all of a sudden, it was just, it was like overnight, wasn't it? The next thing so. about, you know, the drugs and it, in the prisons. And 
and all of this and children are looking up to this and as as you know and as my listeners know it's all about the kids we, you know they're grooming you in the classroom they're going home and then they're putting on their headphones and they're having this I don't know demonic stuff being pumped into their brain That's from right. guys who are really really probably the, the bottom of the barrel yeah it's <laughs> there's, it's such an influence and things have even moved on from what used to get pushed so it was bad enough when in the 90s you were getting criminal lifestyles and gang banging and all this stuff promoted uh now hip-hop is just unrecognizable for what it used to be i don't even refer to it as that anymore because it bears no similarity whatsoever to the culture that it came out of so-called rappers so-called hip-hop so they're pushing contemporary agendas now they've moved on from guns and drugs yeah you still hear about guns and drugs in these records but now as you say they're openly talking about satan about how they worship satan uh you know you had little nas x with his was it nike trainers the other year which supposedly contained blood yes. and you got you got these rappers doing open dark occult satanic black masses in their performances and in their videos, and you've got demonic entities appearing in the videos. Then you've got other agendas being pushed. The whole transgender thing is is getting pushed by rappers, rainbow head rappers, uh, men coming on stage in dresses. This stuff that would have seems been to be, and Dave Chappelle said it, I've seen it in others, and that was all going from what's his name? Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry, he's like way high up in this this whole black Illuminati stuff. He got kevin he gets he gets people in his films to wear dresses it's the humiliation of the black man and yeah. it's pushing an agenda that they're all supposed to be street so that's why you got so many of these guys who are closet gays but they've got this image and they pretend as you said earlier you know about tony blair and his wife mm. um, it, it's that they're fooling the public that they're they're all these tough and they've got all these women but they're if you're gay you're gay just come out yeah, and say gay. it you know it's 2024 really yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Why hide it? I know. Um, so yeah, you got you got rappers pushing all these agendas now, and I tell you, if a prominent rapper had come out in, let's say, nineteen ninety one, let's pick a random year, nineteen ninety one, with rainbow hair, wearing a dress, uh, acting all effeminate, that individual would probably have been shot by the following day. He I'm not saying that's a, played it out I'm, the stadium. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm not endorsing that. I'm just saying that that's the way the times were. That yeah. sort of thing would not tolerate it within those communities. These days, it's absolutely fine. No problem at all. You can praise Satan while wearing a dress and jewellery with rainbow-coloured hair and nobody bats an eyelid. This is the incredible thing, Luke, just that nobody seems to care. Nobody seems to care what's going on. It, it's, they're just getting away with all this stuff. How? How are they putting videos out like this and stage shows like this and people are just accepting it? It's, it's just unbelievable. And these, I mean, I just want to bring Cassie in and what Cassie's lawsuits come out and said about, because Cassie, talk, yeah, you, you probably know far more about Cassie. Cassie was an R in, uh, um, uh, an up and coming R and B singer, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah. And she signed got by Puff. Pretty. So tell us if you don't mind, Mark, because you probably know more about her. Um, what's the story between um, around Cassie and her linking up with Diddy, and um, where we are today? And then we'll wrap it up, and then hopefully maybe during the Christmas holidays we can come and do another part two. Okay. Well. You're probably more up on Cassie's recent. Uh, yeah, 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 I yeah. We we'll just do. We we'll just. You know, we'll, we'll get. Yeah, to I'm, I'm. I'm more the background history stuff, so exactly. I'm sure you can fill listeners in on yeah. on what the story has been recently. But yeah, she was one of the singers signed by P Diddy Puffy to his record label Bad Boy. She came out in the early 2000s, I think. She had a song called uh, "Me and You," which I used to play in the clubs, and a few other minor hits. And so she ended up in a romantic relationship with Diddy, we're told. But again, I suspect Diddy of being homosexual, if not bisexual. Uh, and when I see him out with these women, it just makes me think, well, they're trying to sell this image of him as a heterosexual male when he should just come out and say what he is. You know, why why hide it? Um, but that's what I suspect to be the case. So just reading up on it this morning, uh, Cassie has accused Diddy of sexually exploiting her and 
I've read other stories that two other women have come forward, but in another version of the story, it's three other women with similar claims. And it's like R. Kelly rebooted. It's all these women accusing Diddy basically of running this sort of mind control sex cult type thing and uh, uh, plying them with drugs and alcohol and getting them to perform sexual acts, which they don't want to against their will. Uh, Again, I'm sure you can fill people in on the sort of recent detail, but that's what I know about his relationship with Cassie. Yeah, she... um... It, it was it, it 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 sounds absolutely horrendous. I've read now that there's four cases going on. One person's keeping their name out of it. I can't. I haven't got everything in it because we're just we're looking at the past. But basically, she got with him. She was only with him for maybe a year or so, but in that year or so, um, he they would browse. They'd browse websites for male prostitutes, male escorts, who did he would instruct what this male escort to touch and what to do with Cassie. So he would sit there and instruct them, like, I don't know, direct their their sessions. But then it would bring other people in and other men in. And these, these they were called freak-offs, and they could occur up to three times a week. And um, uh, there's the, the reports are, many reports are, that Will Smith was at the freak-outs. Evan Hart was at the freakouts. And obviously we've now, we move a bit forward to Usher, who was introduced obviously to Diddy as a young boy. And I do think, I do believe you, you'll, you'll probably know more um, that Usher Diddy was actually given parental rights and guardianship over Usher. Wow. In the day. And yeah, Usher, Kevin Hart released at Diddy's birthday party. Well, they, Kevin Hart was going around interviewing people at Diddy's party and Diddy comes up and he's on the mic and he's saying that when him and Usher get out of bed in the morning, they do, um, they have fights and rumbles first thing when they wake up and Kevin Hart's just saying, should you be saying that? We're live. Wow. It's, it's shocking. It's shocking. And then Justin Bieber has been quite open about it, that he went and spent a weekend at Diddy's and what he was exposed to sounds like a really bad movie doesn't it Weekend it really is movies. and then you look at a video that they're taking and i think it was i don't know maybe day two of um justin bieber there did he walk around and he's he's grooming him in front of everybody it goes right when you're old enough you see that over there when you're when you're 18 that's going to be yours and he's putting out a lamborghini just go well i've got my i've got my um my learners, you know, you could come out with me. No, 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 no. That's when you, when you're 18, I'm going to, I'm going to get you by your mansion when you get to 18, the groom on stage. And there's, there's clips of Justin Bieber at this party at 14 years of age. And the only clip it gives, it pans around and you've got Diddy and coming up from underneath where the camera is sort of like waist height of a person comes up is Justin Bieber looking it's disturbing, Mark. This is so dark. They've got the billionaires in there as well. Whereas you're saying the protection, I think this is where it all comes from. These high-ranking billionaires. Um, it's 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 so dark, and it you know we we're, we're not doing it. We can't get it all through in this hour, and I'm, mm. I'm going to close it up because this is a subject that's so very very important. I think it's gonna. I think this may pan out the way the music industry kind of goes once all of this. Well, it's all unravelling, isn't it? We we have to ask ourselves why it's all unravelling, you know. Uh, Cynics would say that the controllers never let a story out like this unless it serves them in some way. And they've decided that it's time to throw Diddy under a bus for whatever reason. I'm not sure why they would want to do that because it just brings scrutiny of Ah. the way the entire industry operates. So I wonder if the unravelling of all this stuff and all these revelations is is something deeper and more I think it's something deeper. I think it's the mm. I think the the, the these four, these rulers of the world have um dropped the reins and I think things are starting to pick up. I know we're looking like it's dark days but I mean I remember a year ago everyone was adamant that we were all going to get taken out of our houses at gunpoint. I know. If we didn't and we were going to be put in all of these um these ca- super <laughs> prisons. Super prisons because we don't, and it wasn't. It's the only way we can wake people up is if we get to that point. 
that it, people can start feeling it and seeing it for themselves that your everyday Joe who doesn't do the research and like what we do and and this community, the truth community do, when your average person who sits there and watches the BBC news starts to see that is what's going to bring the change. And it never happened. Mandated vaccines never happened. Mandated masks. Exactly. Yes, we're preaching exactly. that point. But I yep. think this is going to get darker. I think we're going to get so much more. Diddy, I think, is just the first. We're going to see the demise of Jay-Z. We're going to see the demise of a lot of people. Yeah, uh, coming it's, it's up. so close. It's so close it to is, especially all, with this, the all this it, ugly stuff coming out. And it just makes me wonder whether there's some sort of truth vibrations, for want of a better phrase. It's something about these times where truth is just coming to the surface and it's unstoppable. And all these things that have remained hidden for decades or even longer are, are starting to come out. For some reason, it's something about these times in which we're living. It seems as if the controllers have dropped the ball. Again, I would, you know, critics would say, no, no, this is a psyop and they know exactly what they're doing. I'm not sure that they do. It just feels like the wheels are falling off the bus at this point. And you've got the Jeffrey Epstein. They've now come out and said the Jeffrey 170 names. And I don't think they're going to be redacted. I think we're going to have full access. There's a hundred and that's going to be in like, the beginning part of January. Now, interesting. I'm not going to dig too into it. But I'm just going to say also around that time, there is a gentleman who has been in prison for the last four years. He hasn't been in front of a judge yet. He has, or maybe it's five years, might be more. His name is Jonathan Oddy. Okay. Remember that name, Jonathan Oddy. He's no one, well, he's very significant, but he wasn't. He's from South Africa. He's been sitting in a jail in Florida. He is the first of Cassie and Diddy's male um, escorts that they got from a company called the Dancing Bear. This is back. But this man, this Jonathan Oddy, he was the man who ran in to the Trump Hotel in Florida and started shooting it up. I don't know if anyone remembers that. This is back, I think, 2016. He ran in and he started shooting in, in a hotel. And during his police interview, he comes out with a bombshell that he was Diddy and Cassie's sex slave. He's now mentally ill because of the things that he saw. He goes on to talk about the billionaires who fund Diddy and the movement of liquid cocaine, women, guns, all around America on the private jets. This guy exposed everything back in 2017. And the only reason he was arrested because of the shooting at the hotel. Mm. In the interview, he comes out with this information. It is jam-packed. And guess what? His court case has been cancelled 12 times over these years that he's supposed to go in front of a judge, but he's still sitting in the local county prison. Never been charged. That's due also beginning of January. So I don't believe in coincidences, Mark. I don't believe in coincidences. I it's difficult to know how they're going to brush all this under the carpet. No, now, they can't. They, they absolutely cannot. This is, this is the end. So 2024, strap yourself in. Absolutely, Mark. Listen, let's, if you don't mind coming back on, because... You're so knowledgeable and I love speaking to you. You're such a, the best guest to have because of your wisdom on certain subjects. Um, would you be would you be up for coming on in between? the? I know you're probably really busy with gigs and what have you. But in the next week or so, if you do get a spare hour, can we continue this? We can continue it. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it in that time frame. It's going to have to be, you know, a bit further forward from that. But yeah, definitely we need to do a part two. There's another story which I meant to relate about Diddy from his early go on, years. Go on, get it in quick. Well, should we do it in part two? All right, then. We'll keep, yeah, keep, keep everyone guessing. It is important. You know, it's relevant to what we've been talking about. But um, yeah, it's just amazing to me now that I spent all those years as a DJ going to New York and playing all these records and stuff. And I loved all these artists. I actually loved uh, bad boy record stuff at the time, Biggie and 112 and Total. I love Mary J. Blige and uh, Aaliyah and all these artists. And it's just so surreal that a couple of decades on, I'm on a show like this, exposing all this dark stuff that I had no idea was going on at the time. But at least all that experience and knowledge is not going to waste, right? Oh, <laughs> we're, I mean, we're doing something with it. 
Yeah. I mean, the stuff you found out about the, about the, you know, the 80s and 90s. I mean, I went back and, and rewatched some of the videos when we did one of our Illuminati music industry. And it was so in your face, the boy George. But I'm going to go off on another tangent, Mark. How can people see what you're doing? Get your books. Give us all your details and your links. Okay, so my main website is djmarkdevlin.com. And from there, you can go through to my videos, my podcasts, and my books. I've got three volumes of my Musical Truth book, which gets into all of this and so much more. So they're on Amazon. But if you want to get copies from me directly, you can drop me an email. My email address is on my website. Also, I've got audio books of two of the Musical Truths and my two novels. So I'm, I'm working on the second audio book at the moment, put out two novels as well. I've got a whole ton of videos on my YouTube, BitChute, Odyssey and Rumble. Again, uh, links to all of those from the main website. I've got all my audio podcasts on Spreaker. And yeah, there's just a ton of stuff there. So for anyone new to the subject of what really goes on in the music industry, I've got about 15 years worth of material that you can take the deepest ever dive into. They are unbelievably well researched. I can absolutely vouch for that. Mark Devlin, thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, have a very, very Merry Christmas. No worries. Same to you, Lou. Take care. So that Thanks was Mark Devlin. I oh, such a joy of a guest. Um, LibertyTactics.co.uk. We are going to be talking to Andy Heesman and Ross Lahive regarding more of what's going on in the music industry. We're also going to have a look at some big corporations, one in particular called Aegis, A-E-G-I-S. It's run by a guy, um, it's Aegis Trust. It's run by a guy called Jason Smith. Jason Smith is based in Nottingham and he appears in Jeffrey Epstein's phone book. Not just one phone number for him. I think there's about four phone numbers for this gentleman. Aegis Trust is a corporation that that raises and sends people like Bill Clinton over to over to um, homes in Africa for for the very poor and needy and to help the children. Aegis Trust is a non government organisation over helping these small villages in Africa. So they decide to send people like Bill Gates and others more to come later on this mark devlin will be back libertytactics.co.uk we'll see you later